Thank you, Lord. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Good morning. Good to see everyone. Specifically, get to meet uh, Steve Skinner, who is here with us this morning. Is it from Australia? Is that right, brother? Rich? Australia and Philadelphia. Those are two worlds apart, aren't they, brother? <laughs> well, welcome, brother. It's great to meet you. First time I've got to meet you, and uh, really enjoyable just getting to chat with you and uh, talk and give you a hug, and thank you. And everybody who's here this morning, welcome. Good to see you guys, and a lot of uh, scriptures this morning, so I'm going to uh, delve into the scriptures, and uh, I am attempting, and this I think will be my final attempt, to finish uh, what I started as pertains to the book that I've been speaking about, and uh, I think this will be the final message. It could go on, but... Somewhere there has to be a cutoff point. This, I think, is going to be it, Victor. I just give up the ghost and that's it. <laughs> so uh, let's pray that I can give up the ghost after this. How's that? <laughs> Lord, I, I do bless you so much. Um, needs to be said, can be said, unknown to me. But you know, Lord. I'm asking for your wisdom that I so desperately need and want you being the man of wisdom and that whatever we're able to share this morning, whatever limitations and boundaries and extent, that Lord, you would get that which is pleasing to you and that your wisdom, your understanding, your revelation would be in it by your spirit. There's no dependence upon the flesh in this, no dependence upon the soul, no dependence upon human intelligence, human emotions, uh, human willpower. Our dependence, Lord, is completely and totally upon you. It is by your spirit or it is nothing to do with you. I thank you for that plumb line. May it be dropped in me further and further and further until, Lord, um, the purpose of this time here upon the earth is completely and totally unto you, for which, Lord, I and all of us exist. Drop that as a reality, I ask, Lord, a reality. Not a doctrine, not something we agree to, not something we give our amen to or yes to, but that is lived. That, Lord, is proclaimed by example. That, Lord, the time is short, and we have spent enough time in the church with church stuff, with our stuff, with Christian stuff. May that time end quickly within each of us to the simplicity and to the purity of Christ himself. I ask you to deliver us here from the old wineskin. Whatever the gathering has become, and if it is an old wineskin, that you would kill it. And whatever we've brought into it, Lord of ourselves, that is not you, you would take that down as well. And you would have here as well as every place else a people in love with you. Do exactly what you showed Isaac. Rip open our hearts today, not tomorrow, today. Begin again today 
both the exposing part of that, but more than that, it is the newness of relationship and the depth of relationship for which we crave. That is you, Lord, the knowing of you. We want to know you. And may we be willing, Lord, to suffer the loss of all things as Paul ex expressed, particularly his former life and Judaism. May we suffer the loss of all things, including, hear me, my people, I ask. All of us here, I'm just going to give us a, mo a moment to respond to the Lord. And you don't have to stand, you don't have to do any of that. But if you can detect from discerning properly something of the Lord in this moment, that there's an old wineskin in me, wherever it's at, being our thinking, our mind, still a longing, still a craving for things that you, Lord, have made meaningless in your cross. Just whatever, put your hand on your heart, whatever, and let's ask the Lord for a moment of deliverance from an old wineskin mentality. And with it, the Babylonian mentality that was always about making a name for yourself. It is the Lord Jesus we're asking to arise in us and take back our hearts and make them fully yours. Fully yours, Lord. Bring us to a new day beyond yesterday, beyond up into this moment. Bring us into a new relationship, a possession of the Lord, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, the order of Melchizedek, a people of God's own possession, and begin it again today, I ask. I ask, Lord, that uh, our diet would change so that our craving would be for the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, not for the things of God or the doing of things for God, but the God of all things himself. And then in a possessing way, Lord, you would grab hold of us and take hold of us and bring down our own whatever and you arise within us. And we're asking this not just individually. There's too much of that individualism. We're asking for a corporate expression called the gathering. A corporate expression where the large preponderance of your people are in the reality and in the good of the work of the cross. Not as a doctrine, not as a truth we hold to, not as this or that, but in the reality that I am crucified with Christ and I no longer live. Bring that to reality. And so that, Lord, you may be the resurrection and the life expressing yourself, we ask, Lord, here at the gathering and beyond. In a sober and somber moment, we declare to you, Lord, that the church has no reason to exist unless it is to represent, to express to be a living expression of a living Christ here upon this earth. And it's not here for social reasons. It's not here for religious reasons. It's not here for any of that trash. We are here for you. Set our hearts ablaze and thus set our hearts anew with passion, with love, with hunger for the Son of God himself. Wouldn't you agree, guys? <laughs> Wouldn't you agree, Mark? Passion for the sun. Isn't that right, Mina? Passion for the sun. Isn't that right, Adam? Rachel? I go around the room. Passion. We want a passion for the Son of God. May the Lord end this thing in our time. But it will be ended only if there is this passion, this hunger this thirst for the Son of God, if we can come out of all the nonsense of church and churchism, of Christianity and all its isms, and find the living Christ to be expressed in this time. For such the gathering was formed, and it has no other reason to exist. And if we've come here for any other reason, you came to it for the wrong reason. We have come to be a person's body, not our own people. We have no reason to exist 
outside of Jesus Christ. Nor do I desire, nor does the Lord desire our existence outside of Christ. Does that make sense, folks? Let's just really get to the root of this matter. Church must end as we have known it. And we must be, not do, be finally. The doing's a bunch of nonsense without the being first. Stop doing and become. That's the word of the Lord for us in our time. All his people everywhere. Doing becomes a substitute. Hiding what's in our hearts. A cover up. A facade. Being is reality. What are we? God's not uh, <laughs> fooled in the present church situation. I'm addressing the gathering because we're here. When I'm addressing the church at large, where we're not there, and every gathering of people throughout the earth, it is time for God's new day to where he gets what he wants, not us. Why does it matter what you and I want? God's not concerned about it. Why should we be? He has no thought in that way and will not support it. He's after what he wants. Nothing less and nothing more. Otherwise, we become an old wineskin. So, again, Lord, this, uh, what Isaac saw, this addressing of our hearts, this ripping open our chest, Do it, Lord, I say, in me, with me. And do not let me escape the fear and the terror of the Lord that is meant to be in it. It causes me to run to you, not shrink back and hide. Have you had your chest rip open lately <laughs> by the Holy Spirit? It means God loves you. It also means that God wants to fill us. So Lord, as you rip open our chests, let go out what we are and let come in who you are. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. So uh, let's look at some scriptures. Like I said, there's a lot of them. I'm going to begin in the Gospel of John with... Uh, Two specific passages, we'll not uh, read everything in them, just a reminder of what we already know, but um, as I have been speaking for the past several months, um, pretty consistently, I think there was one message that I shared that was not to be a part of the book, I made that clear. Most everything else I've shared since the beginning of the year has been meant to be a part of this book. Um, I've come to what I want to talk about this morning is, uh, and this is what I've been talking about, the necessity of God-given uh, leadership. How leadership becomes a part of God's solution to the problem that has biblically always been seen. Whenever there was a condition of fallenness or backsliddenness or waywardness amongst the people of God, God raised up leadership. The lack of that leadership allowed the people to continue in their every man doing what's right in his own eyes. Remember, we talked about that. Isn't that right, Madeline? We talked about the book of Judges and how that was spoken. And at the very end, the last verses of the book of Judges, it shows where things had gotten to. It had come to a point to where every man was doing what was right in their own eyes. That's what happens when God's government, the headship of God, is not among a people. It's a consensus. It's a democracy. And it's not. It's a theocracy. Amen? How many will agree with me? When Christ comes to reign in Jerusalem, there's no democracies left in the earth. 
that and every other ism comes down with it. Isn't that right, Steve? It ain't just communism. Democracy itself is as evil as communism. We just can't see it. And we're seeing it now, huh? There's a world of difference between a republic and democracy. And history is now being rewritten that we're a democracy. We were never a democracy. We were a republic. Amen? A republic allows for the rule of God. A democracy allows for the rule of people. Isn't that right, Caleb? This is not a democracy. And what God's going to have is not a democracy. He doesn't want it in his church. He doesn't want it on the earth. All the kingdoms of this world fall at the coming of the Ancient of Days. And everything else that you've ever known and I've ever known and ever been a part of and ever seen in the world you can see presently tumbles with it. And nothing like we've ever known will be the time we live in. Get ready for it, inwardly speaking. Look around. This will all be gone. In fact, I can tell you this from the Lord, beginning with the potholes, the deluge, and the invasion, Christianity, organized Christianity in this nation will be forever gone, completely destroyed by the shaking of the Lord himself. That is the will of God. That sounded like a fantasy. It is not a fantasy. The Lord is going to topple in the new republic so that the new republic is not inhabited by the haunts and the birds and demons of Christianity. So he will destroy organized Christianity. Destroy it. It will be defunded during the deluge. It will be wiped out in the invasion. And in Isaiah 60, the glory of the Lord will rise upon the new republic prior to his coming. Anyway, there's more to be said about that. That's a down-the-road thing, and I'll talk about it more. I give us warning, my friends, this thing called Christianity in this land is going to tumble. And that which is not a part of the new republic will join directly to the spirit of the false prophet and antichrist out of Europe and will be a part of it, and declare war upon the republic. Somber moment, huh? Wake up and realize the time we're in, and stop the nonsense. Live it for once. Let our minds get back on the Lord, off ourselves. Can you hear what I'm saying? It's a strong word. It needs to be. I fear for the gathering. We've heard much. We live little. Well, don't say that, Terry. It's not true. It's absolutely true. Ask the Lord about it. We are quite responsible. We live it so little. Such sickness is among us because of that very reason. You want to know why? I'll tell you why we're so sick. Because of what I just told you. We've heard way too much. We live way too small. We still live. And what's it going to take? More death? Is that what it's going to take? Or are we going to wake up? It is not me saying this. I'm telling you from the Lord the truth. I've waited for months and months and months to address it. And now's the time. I cannot be a leader here, and I will not be. If we're going to water this thing down and close our ears to the Lord, and the gathering becomes something other than what God purposed for it to be. You have come to a consuming fire, the living God. You've not come to Disneyland. Amen? How can you live with a consuming fire? I addressed this years ago. You must join with him, and so must I. And if you don't, and I don't, there's trouble. We become a wineskin because of the nonsense. 
of wanting our stuff. I say to us again, wake up, people of God. At the gathering, wake up before it's too late. It does not matter what we can quote. It does not matter what we can echo. It does not matter. Where is your hearts? Where's my heart? That's where God's at. And what are we in the good of? Are we living it? Are we walking in it? Is the cross a reality to us or is it a doctrine we've adopted? Better to hear it now than stand before him and have it said right to your face. This is why people don't like the word of the Lord. Because we want to play games and this is no game. How many know that? This is not a game time, my friends. Is that not right, Adam? This is no game. This isn't party time at the gathering. I shouldn't even have to say these things. But we live in time where anything and everything goes. And all sense of the time we're living in just goes right out the window. The whole world is changing. Look around. And you're going to be hunted if you become the real believer in Christ that he wants you to be. And then it won't be a game, will it? But that's just Terry. Forget about it. That's what goes on. Familiarity breeds contempt. Over-familiarity breeds it heavily. And we got alternatives. And we can go someplace else, which is a good thing. To stay here is to face an excessive amount of judgment of God upon us because of what we're hearing. Ours is not a sin of ignorance. Ours is a sin of light and against light. Ours at the gathering is a sin against the truth a sin against the person, a sin against what's been shared for years and lived so little. Like this nation, great judgment is stored up. Would be better if we'd have never known, never heard. So leadership becomes something more, wouldn't you agree? Would you agree? Something more than just pastoring people who want their own lives. Leadership is unto God first, not people. God getting what he wants. Am I saying that rightly? You better believe I am. I'm responsible. You guys know that, right? Josiah is responsible. Chris is responsible. There's responsibility. Do not take that responsibility lightly here at the gathering. You may, I don't. You you can afford to, I can't. The word of the Lord to us is be warned and be wary. Lest we become like everything before us, nothing but an old wineskin. Amen? Anybody feel warned in the room? God's not fooled, my friends. He sees the heart. He sees the heart. And he knows it's desperately wicked. Do we? Well, leadership then is of an entirely different dynamic as God sees it. So let's look at this in John for a little bit here and uh, bring more clarity to what I'm trying to share. I have to warn us, though, there is a warning in this. 
If we're going to be made ready, and that's an if, not a given. Being here will not make you ready. Only the Lord, by His Spirit, can do that. Being here may be the worst thing for us if we're unwilling to go all the way. Being here, coming here, bringing your agendas here is the worst possible thing that could happen. May all agendas be laid down at that door and never enter in. There's one agenda here, Christ, and there is no other. And to be his people. You know that? Amen, Terry. Thank you, Terry. That's a great message. You're right, it is. <laughs> so you're not talking about me, Terry, are you? I am. And me. I'm talking about every one of us in this room. No exceptions. Every one of us. I'm warning you. I'm warning myself. I'm warning all of our hearts. We are in danger. And I'm telling you, we are. We are in danger. Rend your hearts, not your gar garments. Language is cheap. Live it. Right? So leadership has a call to God that is entailed in what I am saying. Leadership belongs to God or it's not worth its salt. Amen? Any leadership that is leading people into their things is not of God. It does not matter who he or she is or elders or anyone else, which I'm going to talk a little bit about this morning. None of that matters. I want to say something to us that is stunningly true according to the scriptures. It was the bishops and it was the overseers and if it, it was the elders of the New Testament who became the greatest threat to the apostolic ministry in their time. It was they who led the rebellion against the apostles and prophets and teachers of the New Testament. It was they who rejected the apostolic teaching of Christ himself. It was the elders directly responsible for Laodicea. It was the elders directly responsible for Sardis. It was the elders directly responsible for Thyatira. It was the elders, it was the bishops. It was the overseers who were the false teachers. It was the elders. It was the bishops. It was those who were overseeing, who were the false prophets. Did you hear what I said? What made them false? What made them false? Themselves. Their own wants. Their own desires. An ear, here it is, Steve. An unanointed ear that's anointed by blood for God's voice only instead of people. Unanointed thumbs, the right hand thumb. That's there unto God in service unto God, not people. An unanointed big, right big toe that's there to walk with him and walk before him. As he says in the scripture, walk before me and live, not people. The people are secondary. God is first. The church is not about people. The church is about a representation and an expression unto Jesus Christ. People can be a part of that or not. We can go to church or we can live it and be it. But we have choices. We have a smorgasbord. We have a buffet mentality now. And we don't like it, we go someplace else. Great. But we're going to stand before God. And the question that's going to be put to us is if he ever knew us. No matter what you did for him. I say to the young people in the room, forget about what your mother, fathers and mothers are doing if they're not living it. You live it. Live it. You will be responsible. Live it. I say to the parents, live it and lead by living. I say to the leaders of the body of Christ, the elders, now they've become pastors. Never was in the New Testament, but that's what's happened. To the elders, to the bishops, to the overseers, 
It is what you are and who you are before God that matters, not before men. It is not your paycheck. These are not official positions that God called you to. God does not appoint officials. He appoints men and women who are crucified with Christ and no longer live. Amen? I want to say this all up front before we get into the details of elders, somewhat details, Steve, of bishops and overseers. None of the language matters. None of the Greek words or the Old Testament words for elders matters. If firstly, firstly, we're not those possessed of the Spirit of God and everything is by my Spirit, says the Lord. Amen? We have a leadership now that is anything but what I just said. It is positional. It is ecclesiastical. It is denominational. It is organized by man, run by man, run by money, run by Babylonian spirit called make a name for yourself. And the leadership of which God desires is a leadership of his own choosing and of his own making. And that individual and those individuals must embrace the cross. The greatest judgment will abide upon leaders. And those, and let me say it to all of us in the room, not many of you should desire to be teachers knowing that your judgment will be more strict. Do you understand that principle? We understand then, therefore, leadership carries a cost. And it's a high price, Enoch, is it not? And if God says, get out, we get out, don't we, brother? Some of us have had to live that, isn't that right, Mike? If the Lord says leave, the Lord says leave. Not lead, leave. <laughs> if the Lord says run, you run. If the Lord says stay, you stay. If the Lord says live, you live. If the Lord says die, you die. Make sense to anybody? What am I saying? We are in sovereign hands, not our own. If we're to lead. <laughs> you like that, don't you, Kyle? What do you think, Bob? You think that's the truth, brother? It's absolutely true, isn't it? This system of Christianity, I say to you again, in this land is going to be toppled, and I've been saying it for years, shaken because it's shakable. And the Lord's going to topple it suddenly in the deluge, followed by invasion. It's all coming to nothing, which is what it means to God to begin with as far as the system goes. People mean something to God. The system means nothing to God. God wants a leadership, hear me, of strong convictions that holiness is no joke. Purity is no joke. Being the Lord's is no joke and not a laughing matter. Being completely given over to the Lord instead of ourselves is not an option. It's a must. Of being rewired from the inside by the Spirit of God to the proclamation, to the example living of Christ is not an option. Without purity, no man's going to see the Lord. You understand that, right? But everything's been redefined in our day. And what uh, years ago was taboo in the church has become an open door now, a playground of Satan. I understand, guys. There was a lot of religious nonsense in the ode. But we have gone way over into the other ditch. And there's no distinction now to amount to anything between the world and the church world. We live like them. We act like them. We do everything like them. God aims to make a distinction between the righteous and the wicked again. And he's going to do it by death. so that the population of this nation is reduced by over 50%. You heard me right. And what will be a devastation to this nation and others, no use running. You cannot escape. There is only one hope in this, and that's the God of all hope. 
I was merciful by saying over 50%. Because it's way lower than that. You awake? You understand what's about to happen? You understand what you're going to live through if you live? I would be remiss to not warn us clearly. I cannot talk about the potholes. I cannot talk about the deluge. I cannot talk about invasion without getting to the nitty gritty of this thing. When blood up to the horse's bridles becomes a reality, Madeline, not a joke. A biblical fulfillment, not a fantasy, many. Right? We face what will be the most destructive times in human history. You hear that? The most destructive times in human history. We face what will be the glory of the Lord rising within a remnant. A remnant. Few there be that find the life. Are we a part of that few? Or are we playing games here at the gathering? Are we in the reality of what we read? Are we in the reality of what we pass around? Do we love teaching? But not the teacher? I'm talking, I'm talking about me now. But I'm about the Lord. Do we love information, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And the information it can give even about Christianity? Or are we in the good of it? Can we sing it but not live it? Can we dance it but not live it? Everything will be shaken. Everything. What is this, Terry? It's a call to repentance right here at the gathering. It's a call to being filled with the Holy Spirit instead of ourselves. It's a call to come out to the Lord in this time. Young, old, it does not matter. I detect something like Paul detected in in Acts chapter 19 when he came among the Ephesians and found believers. And he asked them a question. And I'm going to ask us a question from the Lord. Have you been filled with the Holy Spirit since you believed? Because example says otherwise. What do you think about that, Mike? Why would you say such things, Terry? Because I love God and I love you enough to tell you the truth before you stand before him and it's too late. So in Acts chapter 19, Paul comes among Ephesian believers. And he has that question for them because he sees something that's not right. He sees something that's not real. He sees something that's not of the Lord. Not just a little bit of something, Adam, a lot of something as to who's living. So he has the right question, doesn't he? Have you been filled with the Holy Spirit, guys? Are you continuing to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Is what's written in the epistles true of us? Keep being filled with the Spirit? Or did we stop? Somewhere down the line, we stopped being filled with the Holy Spirit, Steve, and we got more filled with us again. We got more filled with Christianity. The cross was no longer able to work because we've become the people at the gathering who are after Jesus. But is that true? Is that real? Is that the truth of us? That may be a banner over this house that don't make it real of me or you. Location doesn't matter to God. What's in here does. What we're hearing doesn't matter. What we're reading doesn't matter. What we know doesn't matter. What we are matters. What are we?
If the Lord desires to take down the gathering, I want you to understand I'm in favor. If it demands that before we can get to the Lord, I'm in favor of it. My hands are off. It's in the Lord's hands. Don't worry. There's always someplace else to go. <laughs> That's the way the American church responds. The only the reason the Lord will take down the gathering is because of us. To get at us. Let me say that again. Thank you. I will, Joel. <laughs> the only reason the Lord would take down the gathering is to get to us. You folks who've come in from the outside and other states and other areas, why did you come? Was it for more of Christ? Was it for fellowship? Wrong reason. Was it for social things? Wrong reason. Was you're my people? Wrong reason. There's one reason. The Lord and the Lord alone. Not to be near Terry for sure. I hope this message makes you not want to be around me. <laughs> for I'm not in this for popularity, and I never was. I would rather the Lord receive the reward of his sufferings. I would rather be pleasing to him, Enoch. I would rather stand before the Lord and hear him say, Well done, good and faithful servant, than all the accolades and praises of people, Victor. I'd rather the Lord look me in the eye, for he surely will. He surely will, Bev. He surely will. Look us all right in the eye. Eye to eye. There'll be no shrinking back then. There'll be no exceptions. There'll be nothing, Madeline. Eye to eye. Do you know me or don't you? Right, Amy? Anybody detect the fear of the Lord in the room? The Lord would baptize us again in the fear of the Lord that makes us get out and get to him. Not run and hide, get to him. What am I pushing us to this morning? What is my agenda? Get to the Lord, young and old. Let the gathering become something of substance rather than talk. Can you hear what I'm saying? My plea before you. Let the gathering be something of substance be something of reality. Let the gathering be something that counts in this earth. Is that not right? For God, unto God, in a testimony of the Lord Jesus that is real, Deb, isn't that right? Is that not why we're here, Frank, Leah? Something that counts, Andy and Heidi. Something that counts, Bob. Something that counts, Enoch and Tammy. Going around the room. <laughs> Something that counts for the Lord, though. Rick and Denise, right? Something that the Lord can say, this is mine. It's what happens here in John chapter 2 when Jesus is baptized. It's the beginning of public ministry of Christ. Catch that. And the Holy Spirit. Why is it the beginning? Because the Holy Spirit comes upon him. It doesn't depart, Enoch. And the Holy Spirit says, as he comes, he says, this is the beginning of the mission of God in the Christ. The beginning. Right? It's in John 2. It's in the Gospels, uh, the other Gospels as well. When Jesus is being baptized, the Spirit of God descends upon him in the form of, of a dove. It's there that John the Baptist fully recognizes that his cousin happens to be the eternal Son of God, now the Son of Man, been given by God. The Holy Spirit is there in a possessing way of the Christ as to mission, though. Not to being, to mission. Y'all hear what I'm saying? And then let me connect it here. It's the same in Acts chapter 2. At the beginning of his body, do you hear what I'm saying now? As was true with the Son, becomes true of his body. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes. 
I ask us the right question then. Have you been filled with the Holy Spirit since you believed? Are you being filled with the Holy Spirit in believing? Or has there been a departure in our faith from beginning to now in a wrong direction? Miss Madeline, is that not the right question? Where are we, young people? Have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? Are you being filled with the Holy Spirit? Parents, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Are you progressively being possessed? Is the Holy Spirit forming the testimony of Jesus in reality and example? Or are we asserting our femininity? Or are we asserting our masculinity? Are we asserting ourselves into this? Are we leading and guiding where angels fear to tread? Part of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a baptism of the fear of the Lord. If this is the mission of God, it's the mission of God and not the mission of people. If it is the mission of God, it's the mission of God unto eternal thought and not temporal thought. If it is the mission of God, it is the mission of God not to humanity, but to a new creation. Can you understand the distinction? Not to a humanity and humanitarian reasons, but to the eternal plan, the eternal thought, that the knowledge of the Lord will fill the entire universe. Are we gripped by that fact? Or he made this earth bound. They are waiting for us out there, no matter what you believe about it. They've been promised the coming of the bride. That's not Jew, that's not Gentile, that's not any of that nonsense. It is a one new man and a new creation. And they're waiting for the person. They're not waiting for human things. Hello? Why do we exist? And why are we here? And what's this all about? To stumble through this life doing all our human things as though any of it matters. I'm not talking shirk responsibility. I'm saying this. What we're shirking is God's call. God's reason. God's intent. God's purpose. God's life. God's son. Leaders worth their salt will tell you the truth. That is love. Leaders who love themselves will tell you what you want to hear. Because uh, they're paid and they're hirelings. God wants a leadership worth their salt. We understand that, right? What is God's vision for his church? Not this, I can guarantee you that. Not the gathering. Not anything else on the globe right now. Not a way of doing things. It's not a time, it's not a day, it's not a meeting. It never was, not in the heart of God. It's always a possession, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. It was always something that was not of this earth, not of this world, Steve, but born from above, born from above. We call it born again, but let's be clear, born from above, not from this earth. If we're born from this earth, then the earth matters. But if we're born from above, the earth doesn't. It is not our destiny. Christ is. Heaven's not your reward. Christ is. Heaven's not your destiny. Christ is. <laughs> There's no doubt about there being a heaven, but I'd rather know him. That's why I exist. In fact, Colossians says it plainly. We were created for him and by him. Amen? Get, the, get God's picture. We're looking, as the Lord said to me years ago, 
You know, you're looking to get out of here, Terry, and I'm looking to get into you. But can anybody say with me, Houston, we got a problem? <laughs> While the church is crying, get me out, get me out, get me out, even in situations, the Lord's crying out this, let me in, let me in, let me in. <laughs> Amen. Aren't you glad you came this morning? Aren't you sorry that I'm the one sharing? <laughs> Just think this is going into a book so we can read it over and over and over if you want to. I'm going to. I'm saying too many things I didn't plan on saying, so I really want to hear it again. <laughs> There and there, I have no notes. <laughs> I guess you would figure that out, though. <laughs> I just know what's in my heart. God deserves a leadership that is under the headship's direction directly and not under any other direction. Y'all understand? Then what leadership is meant to mean? Leadership, many, is meant to be the expression of the headship of Christ and nothing else. Leadership's not dealing with stupid human affairs. Want me to phrase that in a kinder way? Leadership's not dealing with his stupid human affairs. Was that kind? Leadership, leadership is dealing with something way beyond that. It's dealing with the eternal heavenly. It's dealing with the mind of God, the mind of Christ, the will of God, the plan of God, the thought of God from all eternity without beginning. Leadership, if it is God's leadership, is an expression of the reality, hear me, of Christ being risen. Because the leadership is the headship of Christ in this earth, expressing the reality of Christ to his body. Otherwise, Victor, it's ethereal, right? Oh, we need the headship of Christ. That would be leadership. Y'all hear what I just said? But it's leadership, Steve, that's not its own leadership. It is leadership under the hand of God, where God gets what he wants. Let me say it plainly once again, Adam. Leadership is meant to be the expression in the, in the church, the Spirit of God coming upon the people of God. And Christ coming within the apostles, which he had already spoken to, in headship, in governmental headship. I talked about that, right, Madeline? Christ coming in governmental headship into the apostles, into the prophets, into the teachers. Him stepping into them and filling them. But filling them, not in just the normal way of every believer, filling them in that of governmental headship. So that he is seen on the earth in his headship through the leadership of the body of Christ. Understand what I'm trying to say? Did I say that where it's understandable? We have made this thing quite sickeningly ethereal. Oh, Christ needs to be the head. That's a cry for leadership. It should be. It's a cry for the government of God in that leadership. It's a cry for a baptism of the Holy Spirit where he takes possession of a vessel where the Lord Jesus Christ, hear me, Steve, steps into that vessel as apostle, as prophet, as teacher. Otherwise, he's not being expressed if he doesn't enter as that governmental entity of headship. That's not true with elders, it's not true with bishops, and it's not true with overseers necessarily. They're appointed by the headship of Christ in the New Testament, right? Isn't that true? Y'all know the scriptures like I do. I'll read some of them in a moment. But I'm getting at a point here. What is... In the final analysis of leadership and its importance, why is it so important? Because leadership is there, Mike, to express the headship of Christ, Enoch. It exists for that purpose. It cannot, it must not be its own. Its own ideas, its own concepts, its own human dynamic must go out and Christ must fill. It is a possessing thing and a matter of possession. It demands provenness, not giftedness. Isn't that right, Mark? Provenness. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 2, those who were approved and entrusted with the gospel of Christ. It is not a matter of call. It is a matter of commission, and it is a matter of divine appointment. Calling is the first step. Commission and divine appointment are absolute necessities. Those words demand provenness. It demands the living of it. Now let me talk about in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, right at the beginning of what's called the church. And if that baptism relates directly to the baptism of the Christ, but now it relates to the baptism of the Christ in his body in Acts 2. And that Christ is not absent from this earth. Christ is present. How is he present? Hear what I'm about to say. He is not present in his omnipresence. He is present in his church. Of course he's omnipresent. But if we're just after omnipresence, why does he need the church? Why does he want the church? The church is here as direct proof that the resurrected Christ is here in this earth. In headship, and he has a body. Hello? Now, I said that. Now, let's get the weight of it. Not W A I T. <laughs> Weight of God in this sense. What does that mean for us? Right, Mark? Right, Lacey? What does it mean, Moon? What does it mean, Anna? What does it mean? It means we are here for one purpose and one purpose only, Melanie. No other. We are here for Him. I want to give us a warning about ministry. As God moves us more and more toward his headship, as he possesses a leadership vessel, as he brings that vessel into a provenness through tests, trials, tribulations, through crucifixion, and I'm not just talking about being put to death in that way, I'm talking about of the old man. then it comes with a cost and it comes with a warning. That what yesterday in the outer court of the church didn't get us killed, tomorrow in the Holy of Holies when Christ is in his headship, in his body, will get us killed. Same activity, but the wrong time. When the glory of the Lord, and that's what filled the inner chamber, right? The Holy of Holies. When the glory of the Lord rises in headship amongst his people in the apostolic ministry. When the ministry of divine authorities back enacted among the people of God. Our worldly activities of yesterday will get us killed in the new day. Let me get that down to ministries, Joel, so that we can be really clear that if our ministry is about the prophetic, God's going to take us home. I'm not saying that from a doctrine. I'm saying it from the word of the Lord as a warning. That if our ministry is a tangent, God aims to take us home. To rid the body of such trash. I'm not talking about the person I'm talking about the ministry. What are you saying? We're about to really understand the ministry of the shepherd, his rod and his staff. Amen? How many have ever heard a message like this before? How many hope you'll never hear it again? <laughs> It's going to be in book form. Something resonates inside, I hope, of a fire shut up in our bones 
that God gets his way finally because he's not coming unless he does. That the church belongs to him. You belong to him. You do not belong to yourself. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, choose to glorify God in your body and no one else, especially ourselves. Right? Isn't that right, Enoch? In the military, in the elite soldiers, right? In the best of the best of the best, I say this to all of us, by the way, that which is at the tip of the spear is the most scarred by battle. Leaders have to understand that principle. It's impossible that that doesn't play out that way. But anyway, let me go on. Their training is elite. I talk about this in some of the uh, special forces training and how uh, difficult it is and how difficult it's meant to be. Wimps don't pass the training. Isn't that right, Mike? It's too brutal. It's too hard. It's too difficult. It demands giving your all, holding nothing back. There's a lot to the, this that I don't want to get into all of it, but in the military, to go through to be the best of the best of the best, and what am I referencing now? I'm talking about leaders, and I'm talking to leaders. Prove your call to leadership by your training. Prove it by your standing. Prove it. Show us that you've been approved of God. Show us that the fear of man's been driven out of you and replaced by fear of God. Show us that the Lord's got your ear and not man. Show us that the Lord's got your thumb and not man. Show us that the Lord's got your walk and not man. Prove it. Prove that you're a Levite. Prove that you're part of a royal priesthood. Prove it by blood. Make sense, Dave? That's its spiritual meaning. It always was. It would be said of the Lord Jesus Christ, he spoke only that which he heard his father speaking. That's the right ear. He did that only which he saw his father doing, the right thumb. He was directed only by his father and in the timing of his father. That's the right big toe. In the order of Melchizedek, must follow that reality. Not the teaching of it. Not the knowledge of it. Not the reading of it. The living of it. So I want to say to us this morning some things then, uh, somewhat in closing. Because you know, guys, God gets the leadership that he wants here. If he doesn't have it, God gets the leadership he wants in his church. It will not be man-pleasing. It will not be gift-oriented. It will not be talent-based. Understand what I'm saying? God wants your dedication, not what you can do for him. Do not dedicate what you do. God will not accept it. Dedicate yourself. That's all God accepts. Hello? I'll say it again. You cannot dedicate your gift. You cannot dedicate your talent. He will not accept it. You can dedicate yourself only. And then it's starting all over again. And what God gives after you are completely His, then He will choose to use, and never before. Hello, 
church. We got the cart in front of the horse here. Well, I need to dedicate my talent to the Lord. He'll never accept that. Not ever. It is completely unacceptable to him. I need to get dedicate my gift to him. It is completely unacceptable to him. He will bring the cross to bear. And he will bring it all down. And only that which is of the Spirit is meant to live beyond it. What do you think about that, Julianne? Kind of redefines church, huh? I'm dedicating my preaching gift. I'm dedicating my tongue. What about your heart? Because everything else is unacceptable to him. What does not originate from the Spirit is not of God, period. What is not born of the Spirit is not of God, not ever. Wow, Terry, that sounds like a rebuke. It is to the gathering. Teach your kids rightly. Demonstrate it. Example it. Life and death is in the words I speak. You have leaders who can't be bought. When you have leaders who can't be swayed, when you have leaders that are not afraid of anyone but God, when you have leaders who are under the hand of God, when you have leaders who are not playing games, when you have leaders in the divine authority of God and the ministry of divine authority is back in the church, then the whole gold game is up, many. We're looking at something totally other than that. We are looking, what are we looking at, Terry? The end of church as we know it. The end of our thinking. The end of our ways. And the beginning of what God wants. And is it worth fighting for, Mark, you think? What do you think, Mina? Is it worth fighting for, you think, Adam and Rachel? Is it worth fighting for, guys? What do you think, Isaac? Is it worth allowing the lion manifesting in the gathering? to rip us open and get at something in our hearts that is astray and awry, that we honor him with our lips, but our hearts are far from him. That's the meaning of the, what he saw. That year after year after here, right here in the gathering, we remain the same basic people we've always been. And the testimony of Jesus gets to a lower and lower degree and edge? Is that what we want? Is that our destiny? I don't think so either. I say to you again, I cannot leave that, and I won't. There's no leading of it. It's too much Laodicea. It's too much what God the Father warned me about, 2021 on Lookout Mountain. Here's what he said about the gathering. He said, you guys are 1 Corinthians. Here's what God the Father said about us. You guys are 1 Corinthians. Remember, I shared it. And he said, God help you if you go to 2 Corinthians. How many remember that statement? How many were here when I made it? You think God was kidding? You think I am? You think I'm afraid not to share that? I am not, as is proven. I shared it then, I say it to us again. It is hard living with a consuming fire, and leaders have to understand the consuming fire nature of God. There is no pulling over to rest. There is no congratulations, handshaking, and accolades. There is only going on. There is only forward motion. There is only upward motion. There is only more and more and more. And is that why you came here? Why did God bring you if he did? Why? Why? So we can have another version of Christianity, which is a sickening thing. Why does God want a leadership now that will allow him to be who he is? Allow him to have the church in his image. Allow him to reestablish his headship 
his governance from within to without and among. God is fighting for a leadership worth their salt. Now, I don't get paid here, so you can't defund me. And let me just give us a warning. There's lots of people out there that can hear what's being said, no matter how deaf we are. There's lots of people out there at the time of something. Remember, how many remember Chris Reed's word of the obscure thing that was said to him about July the 11th? How many remember that back in March? How many know what July the 11th now is? The sentencing today of Donald Trump. How many can say with me that God's kiss is upon that? Warning us, right? Warning us, Ken. Warning us. that it is a sign directly from the Lord, July the 11th, that what was shared by Chris and myself is about to play out. And others, by the way. We're not the only ones. Hello? So... The spirit filling becomes the issue with the 12, 11, with Paul, with Timothy, with Silas, with Titus, with Peter, with John, with James. I'm talking about the half-brother of Jesus who was the leader of the church of Jerusalem. That becomes the issue. It still is. I say to us again, have you been filled with the Holy Spirit since you believed? And what are the signs of that? The testimony of the Lord. Has the gathering been filled with the Holy Spirit? Is the gathering we, his people, being filled with the Holy Spirit. I figure it this way, Frank. We're either going to be filled with the Holy Spirit or self. And if we revert back to self, Jesus' warning plays in again, doesn't it? The demon leaves, goes out, gets seven more evil than itself and comes back. And the latter state of that house is worse than the former. You know people like that? Tasted a little bit of freedom. The demon got kicked out, but the Lord didn't come in to the house. And so the demon goes out, gets seven more worse than itself, comes back, founds the house, swept clean but not possessed, and re-enters Amy. And the latter state of that person and of that house is worse than the former. Know people like that? I do. So uh, the elders of the New Testament, and that was a beginning thing. Elder meaning this, you can look this up. Elder means someone who is ripe in age. We have anybody in this room ripe in age. Now let me notice, let me say what I said again. Not that you have age. Ripe. That's referencing fruit. Hello? Prove it by the fruit. By their fruit, you will know them. How many agree with that? By their fruit. Not their words, not their doctrines, not their quoting of whatever that they can quote, echo, mimic, and parrot. Fruit. The great end time harvest is a harvest of fruit not numbers. Every seed that has been sown will reveal its source. 
according to Jesus himself. And the harvesters are not people. They are angels. Hello? To quote the scriptures. Amen? Hello, guys? I'm a harvester. I think not. <laughs> I think the angels are, by direct quote of the scriptures. Hello, Enoch? You heard that nonsense like I have? I'm a harvester. Yeah, well, I think it's the angels, according to the scriptures. Now, guys, I'm going to warn us about the harvest that is upon us. There's more seeds of evil than there are of righteousness. And every seed is going to come to harvest. The fruit of everything sown, Madeline, is about to appear in front of us. Can you not see it in the world around you? What are you looking at? We are looking at the fruit of seed sown throughout the nations over centuries. It will be a bloodletting. It will be World War III. It will be death and blood up to the horse's bridle. And that's a part of the harvest. We think the harvest is only people being saved. It is not. It is fruit, not salvation. How many know we harvest fruit, not seeds? Is that why you grew your tomatoes so you could get the seeds out of them? I mean, you might want to do that, some, but somewhere down the line you want to eat the tomato. How many want to eat the tomato? How many want to eat the potato? In the South, how many want to eat the tomatoes? Where did that come from? Tomato? What in the world is that? I'm sure Scott's got a good joke about that one, what I just said. <laughs> I've heard people say that to me. We were, we're raising tomatoes. What, what? You're raising what? Some of them tell me we're raising cane, Caleb. I get that. C-A-I-N. <laughs> That's the harvest of the church. The way of cane. <laughs> That's a sad joke, but too much the truth anyway. So guys, I, I want to say something to you. In the coming harvest, the elders, the bishops, the overseers must be worth their salt. Understand? Titus chapter 1 Paul tells Titus, I left you behind so that you would bring to order what is lacking and appoint elders in the churches. Notice God did not appoint elders. Christ in headship through the leadership of the apostolic ministry appointed elders. Let me say that again. See the headship of Christ many at work? Hello? Organizations don't appoint elders. Christ in headship. Christ as the apostle. Christ as the prophet. Christ as the teacher. Through that vessel of his possession, Enoch appoints elders appoints bishops, and appoints overseers. Those three words all used in the New Testament. Peter would refer to himself as a fellow elder. The apostle James there in Jerusalem, half-brother of Jesus, not James, the two Jameses that followed Christ, not those two, the half-brother of Christ, James, who was the primary leader in the church at Jerusalem, 
because he was an apostle. Literally saw Christ in his resurrection. Was literally appeared to by the Lord himself. Timothy at Ephesus. John at Ephesus. Silas. Titus. Others. Apostles. Were left in local situations or, better said, sent to local just situations. You can read it in Titus. To bring God's order to the congregation of God. Divine order. The divine headship of Christ. To deal with false teachers being the elders. To deal with false prophets being the bishops and the overseers and the elders. Hello? So we've made false teachers and false prophets some random people. They were the leaders. How were they false? They forsook the apostolic ministry of Christ. They, for, they forsook the teaching of the apostles, which was Christ himself. Hello? That's what made them false. Just wanted to bring some clarity. Is that bringing clarity? Now what about now? What's going on? We got every man doing what's right in his own eyes, pretty much. We got a leadership like that. That God has begun to bring judgment to the house of God. Have we recognized that? Started in Kansas City among the prayer movement. But it isn't ended. And it will continue. He's exposing what should have never been. But long-term evil. And if judgment begins at the house of God, Andy, where will the sinner stand? And if judgment begins in the gathering, and it's going to, and it's actually already started, Started some years ago with the death of people. I'm afraid we've not seen the end of it, though I don't want that to be true. So that by the time Paul was in prison, when he writes First and Second Timothy from a Roman prison, what's called the pastoral epistles, and writes the book of Titus, he has to say that all those in Asia have forsaken me. He's talking about elders, bishops, and overseers, and names their names. Isn't that wonderful? Wouldn't you love to have your name? Like so many others, right? <laughs> right in the scriptures. Hello? Well, that's just not tactful, Terry. By whose standards? Yours, mine, or the Lord's? We would rather cover up. We would rather hide. You know what, Don? We would rather put the whatever over it and act like it doesn't exist. But God knows without repentance, death is coming. Have we at the gathering not learned that lesson. Hello. If we were in ignorance, we wouldn't have to be warned. But we are not. And so the beauty is that God's bringing back what's been lost since the days of the New Testament, his headship in apostolic ministry. He is bringing back the ministry of divine authority that counters the false authority 
that's in leadership in the church, that's in high-minded individuals in the church, that's in people wanting their way in what's called the church, it's in the pride of what's in the church, it's in the independent spirit of what's in the church, it's in all the ideas and the concepts and every good idea that man can come up with except for the revelation of Jesus Christ and what his body actually is and what his body's actually for and what his headship is over and only over, his body, his house. And while we rejoice in the fact that God is bringing into the light, I'm ending, can you tell? <laughs> Should be rejoicing that you survived this message, <laughs> sort of. What are you after in this message, Terry? A reckoning. That's what God's after, a reckoning. You know what God's after? A wake-up call. Here's where you're at, but don't stay there. It is unsafe to remain there. Right? Lest the Jezebel usurper spirit arise in the gathering and get crushed by the Lord himself. Since we're going to have an Antichrist who is the Jezebel usurper spirit at work in the earth and the false prophet, right, Joel? Who is, right, Mark? Who is a usurper of the voice of the Lord? And since, Steve, we're going to have the man who is the lion, right? And we're going to have the man who is the eagle. We're going to see fulfilled what the cherubim expressed concerning Christ. And we're going to have the man who is the uh, ox or the priesthood, the high priest of a priesthood. Let me go further. That we're going to have the man who is the apostle, the lion, the ministry of divine authority. That we're going to have the man who is the prophet, the eagle, the voice of, from the throne. Hello? That we're going to have the man who is the high priest, the teacher. The Levites were the teachers of the people of God, right? And then we're going to see Christ in headship in those three specific areas, again, of divine authority, of the voice from the throne, and of the order of Melchizedek, of which he is the high priest. And we're going to see a remnant emerge, many. Can you say amen? A remnant. It will not be a large number. It will not be a universal revival throughout the earth. It will be a harvest of every seed, and darkness shall cover the earth for a time. And shall be directly confronted by a remnant arrayed in the life and the light of God. We're going to be incredibly outnumbered, and because of Christ, win. As God slays himself through war, through the judgments of God, slays most of the population of this earth. Read the book of Revelation. And spares his own in a percentage that is nonsensical. Whereas... <laughs> Now get out of your, your shorts, men, and your panties, lady. Get a hold of them. Got a hold of them? As 75% of the earth's population is decimated in death, 1% of believers die. How many can say with me, no, that's a distinction? Hello? That is not a random number on my part. And I'm not talking about everything called Christianity. That's in the 75%. <laughs> I 
I'm talking about the people who belong to the Lord. I'm talking about Malachi 3. They are mine. And I shall protect them, Steve, as a father protects his own son. Malachi 3. And I shall make again the distinction between the righteous and the wicked. Malachi 3 and 4. Hello? So how many with me want to say this? Terry, we need the leadership that God would give us in this hour. How many then want the lion that ripped open Isaac's chest? That is the ministry of divine authority. And he did not know all I was going to share today. But I'm going to say something to you boldly. The ministry of divine authority is in effect this morning. And he is ripping open our chest. To see where our hearts are. And see if we're going to shrink back into our everyday things. In our everyday living. And life goes on normal. When God is calling us out of normal. Can you hear that from me? He is calling us out. Is he not many? Is he not Melanie? Is he not calling us out of normal? Is he not challenging us, Scott? Is he not challenging us, Enoch? To come out. Come out to me. Follow me out. You're inside a camp. You're an old wineskin as a person. You're an old wineskin as a people. You're an old wineskin gathering. Come out to me. Come out to me. You're in danger of letting this old wine that you believe in become that which is good enough for you. You are in danger of not hearing what the Spirit is saying. You are in danger of unbelief, in danger of your stubborn self-will, in danger of your independent spirit, in danger of not allowing the Lord to have what He wants and why He formed the gathering. You are in danger, in danger of the substitute, in danger of the counterfeit, in danger of the former. You're in danger. And so the ministry of divine authority, the lion this morning, breaks sin. And he brings a question to us. Have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? Are you being filled with the Holy Spirit? That God can see the lack of fruit. Of his own nature. Of his own son. So I give this invitation to us. You ready? Everybody who want, doesn't want to die, stand up. No, no, that, that's a joke. <laughs> Let me say it. <laughs> say it different than that. How many want the spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, to come in a greater fullness today. This is the will of God, by the way, that you've ever known Him as. No matter what you feel, that doesn't really matter. Reality is in the Lord inside, not what you feel. Not what you can detect by your senses. He's too big for that. But you're going to say, okay, Terry, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, if that's you, I want you to come down. Come down here. We're going to do what Paul did in Acts 19. Y'all know what he did, right? He asked that question. Well, thank the Lord everybody's coming. That's great. Now, Isaac has volunteered to stay here to doomsday until all of you are anointed and laid hands upon <laughs> Right, Isaac? <laughs> so Isaac's going to come around and put some oil on your head. And if you're really as bad as what I just said, he's going to put a lot of oil on your head. And I can't wait to see who gets that. <laughs> That's my sad, bad humor. But anyway, this has been the uh, ministry of divine authority and a very intense message. Wouldn't you say so? But I tell you, Bob, don't you think, brother, that it's time you know what it's time for in the gathering before it's too late? It's time for a reckoning. It's time for reality. Don't you think, Minnie? It is time for reality. This message of divine authority is a reality check. 
It is before it's too late and our hearts get hardened even more. Right? As he anoints you with oil, I'm simply going to pray uh, like Paul prayed for the Holy Spirit to come within you. For the filling of the Holy Spirit and I'm going to lay my hand upon you. There's no step on this side. I don't know what Bob thought he was doing not putting his stuff on the <laughs> Totally kidding, brother. Don't you know I come down this side? <laughs> Fall down this side? <laughs> okay, I'm going to lay hands. I'm going to have to put the mic back up here or we're going to have a problem. Anything you want to sing, go right ahead. Like, uh, Lord, please kill Terry or something like that. Something like that.
Now, Lord, let this be a new day for we, your people, here at the gathering and beyond. A marked day, sealed by the Spirit unto divine will, unto divine purpose, unto divine plan. Our ears anointed by the blood of the Lamb so that we hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. That will become increasingly important. The shepherding of God in the, through the ears is going to become increasingly important in the days ahead unto our salvation, unto Him leading us away from death into safety. We will see the shepherding of Christ beyond this pastoral nonsense. We will see it in its full effect as he governs his people throughout the nations. While we're pouring out his wrath and judgment upon the unbelievers, he leads his sheep to safety prior to doing so. We will see the great shepherd of the sheep in action. And so will the entire universe, by the way, and all the heavens. Seal us, Holy Spirit, now that we can hear. Oh, great shepherd of the sheep, lead us, guide us, direct us. It's not simply survival we're after, it's relationship with you. We would know you, Lord. Open our ears, open our eyes to behold you unto continuing transformation into your image, into your likeness. Bring to us, as Paul writes to the Thessalonians, to be sober, to be awake, to be children of the light and not children of the darkness, that this day, please hear me, not overtake us. Which is not the will of God that we be overtaken. But instead, we be awake and ready. Ask, Lord, for we, the people of the gathering that are here, those listening and who will listen, we ask for already, Lord, a readying of the harvest, the seed that is Christ emerging now and the stalk and the branches appearing quickly, and the fruit, the fruit, the nature of the Christ, the nature of the Spirit, the nature of the eternal Godhead, the Father, Son, the triune God, the Holy Spirit, appear. And that, Lord, as in Revelation 14, you swing your sickle, and the earth is harvested. Make it so, and it will be so, and that in our time. We bless you, Lord Jesus. Let's give a shout. One, two, three. Yes, Lord! Amen, guys.